The U.S. is planning a multi-day response to a drone attack in Jordan that killed three American service members. The strikes will target facilities linked to the Iran-backed militants responsible for the attack. President Joe Biden, while not specifying details, holds Iran responsible for arming proxy groups. The attack involved an enemy drone reaching a U.S. military base, causing confusion and preventing air defenses. The Pentagon identified the three army reservists killed. Tensions between Iran-backed militants and U.S. forces have escalated, with over 165 attacks since mid-October. General Robert Abrams highlights the delicate balance between sending a message and avoiding escalation. Some Republicans call for a reset of Middle East policy, while Secretary of State Antony Blinken emphasizes a potential multi-leveled and sustained response. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has rejected Hamas demands for withdrawal from Gaza and release of militants, vowing to achieve absolute victory over Hamas. Israeli forces killed three Palestinian militants in a hospital raid in the West Bank. Tensions persist as Biden weighs a response to the killing of three U.S. troops in Jordan. UN Secretary General appeals for funding and support for UNRWA, while the UN Security Council urges action to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. U.S. officials consider resuming funding for UNRWA pending investigation. Meanwhile, a U.S. Treasury official visits Baghdad amid tensions in the region. In Israel, a lawmaker faces expulsion for supporting a South African case against Israel in the UN World Court. UN Envoy investigates reports of sexual assaults by Hamas militants during the October 7 attack. The Israeli army is using water to flood Gaza's tunnels, part of a strategy to destroy the extensive underground network utilized by Hamas militants for attacks on Israel. Dubbed the Gaza Metro, there were reportedly 1,300 tunnels covering over 500 kilometers, 310 miles, in Gaza at the beginning of the conflict in October. The military aims to neutralize this threat, especially after Hamas's October 7 attack in southern Israel that resulted in numerous casualties and hostages. Israel has launched an extensive offensive in Gaza since then, causing significant civilian casualties. The decision to flood the tunnels with seawater had been considered earlier, but concerns were raised about potential damage to Gaza's already fragile infrastructure and the risk to civilians. The Israeli army now asserts that the pumping of water was carried out carefully to avoid damaging the area's groundwater, using it as one of several tools against Hamas underground infrastructure. The tunnel network was initially created to bypass Israel's blockade on Gaza, allowing smuggling and facilitating attacks on Israel. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA, faces allegations that some of its employees were involved in the October 7 terror attack on Israel. Stefan Dejaric, spokesman for UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, stated that UNRWA does not work with Hamas, despite assertions from Israel. Philippe Lazzarini, the Commissioner General of UNRWA, has announced plans for an independent review of the agency's operations and risk management. Dejaric highlighted UNRWA's practice of sharing its staff list with host countries, including the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government. However, questions arose regarding whether UNRWA shares its list with Hamas. Which controls Gaza? Dujaric emphasized UNRWA's operational contacts with de facto authorities and denied direct collaboration with Hamas. Israel's allegations have prompted the United States and other donors to suspend funding to UNRWA, raising concerns about the agency's ability to provide essential services to Palestinians in Gaza. The UK is contemplating formal recognition of a Palestinian state, according to Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron. He asserted that the government has a responsibility to pursue a two-state solution, with an independent Palestinian state coexisting alongside Israel. The recent conflict between Israeli forces and Hamas has hindered peace efforts in the region. Lord Cameron suggested that recognizing a Palestinian state, including at the United Nations, could contribute to irreversible progress. While his remarks were welcomed by the head of the Palestinian mission to the UK, they faced criticism from some conservative MPs who deemed the timing inappropriate amid the ongoing conflict. Downing Street downplayed the significance of Lord Cameron's comments, emphasizing the government's commitment to a two-state solution and recognizing a Palestinian state when it best serves the cause of peace. The UK abstained in a 2021 UN vote granting Palestine non-member observer status, while 139 out of 193 UN member states currently recognize Palestine. 
Britain is considering sending an aircraft carrier to the Red Sea to counter drone and missile attacks from Houthi rebels, as the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower prepares to return to America. The Royal Navy may collaborate with the U.S. to maintain a carrier presence in the region. Houthi commander Mohammed al Latifi warned of a prolonged conflict, highlighting the disruption caused by attacks on commercial and naval ships in the Red Sea. The UK and US have conducted joint airstrikes on Houthi sites, but the departure of the USS Eisenhower necessitates alternative arrangements. Calls for the UK to deploy its aircraft carriers have intensified, although concerns about readiness and staffing shortages have been raised. Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, discussed potential recognition of a Palestinian state during a reception with Arab ambassadors, underscoring the UK's commitment to a two-state solution. In Oman, Lord Cameron will address the situation in Yemen and outline measures to deter Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. The developments follow President Biden's remarks on responding to Iran-backed militants in Iraq and Syria, amid escalating tensions in the region. Kataib Hezbollah, the group behind the drone attack in Jordan, announced a suspension of its operations against U.S. forces. A Pakistani court sentenced former Prime Minister Imran Khan to 10 years in jail for violating secrecy laws by making a diplomatic cable public while in power. His former Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi was also given a 10-year sentence in the same case. Khan's lawyer plans to challenge the verdict, citing haste and illegality in the trial process. This marks Khan's second conviction after a separate corruption case last year. Khan alleges the charges are politically motivated, stemming from his confrontation with the military after being ousted in a parliamentary vote. His party faces restrictions in contesting national elections next week. Despite being barred from running, Khan remains popular, though his opponent Nawaz Sharif has gained ground. The verdict impacted Pakistan's stock market, and Khan's aides urged supporters to vote for his party. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg discussed the urgent need to increase defense production for Ukraine's needs during a meeting. They emphasized the importance of preserving NATO's unity and exchanged views on the security situation in the Middle East. They also expressed support for Sweden's NATO membership bid and hoped Hungary would conclude the ratification process. Austin, who recently underwent emergency surgery for complications related to prostate cancer, resumed his duties at the Pentagon after being discharged from the hospital. Between January 8 and 11, 2024, Belarusian observers reported that a Chinese cargo aircraft, Air China cargo Boeing 747-400F, B-2476, conducted four round-trip flights between Urumqi and Minsk National Airport. The plane allegedly transported military supplies to Belarus, and its unusual activity drew attention as it parked in the VIP zone usually reserved for Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. The cargo contents remain undisclosed, but observers suspect military equipment. The flights occurred on January 8, CAO 1095, 9, CAO 1097, 10, CAO 1095, and 11, CAO 1097, each staying in Minsk for three hours. The aircraft consistently parked in Space 1A, reserved for Belarusian government planes, raising concerns about potential customs bypassing and secretive cargo handling. During a House Select Committee hearing, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo criticized the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, for its infiltration of American institutions and accused Chinese President Xi Jinping of not being held accountable for the COVID-19 pandemic. Pompeo highlighted CCP's efforts to influence social media and target American youth, emphasizing Xi's alleged role in the pandemic spread. He also warned against CCP's influence on state governors and mayors, labeling the party as truly evil and stressing its pervasive nature across various levels of government. Pompeo clashed with Rep. Jake Auchincloss over election integrity but affirmed President Biden's legitimacy. He and former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta advocated for a strong stance against China, emphasizing the importance of deterrence and supporting Taiwan. Pompeo criticized the Biden administration's handling of foreign policy, particularly in Ukraine, stressing the need for a proactive approach to global challenges. Taiwan's government expressed anger over China's unilateral change to a flight path near the sensitive median line in the Taiwan Strait, seeing it as a potential move to alter the status quo for military purposes. China's Civil Aviation Administration announced the cancellation of an offset measure for the southbound operation of the M503 flight route, which runs close to the median line. 
This line has traditionally acted as an unofficial boundary between Taiwan and China, but China does not recognize its existence and has been sending warplanes over it to assert sovereignty. China also announced the opening of routes from west to east, towards Taiwan, from the cities of Xiamen and Fuzhou. Near Taiwan controlled Kinmen and Matsu Islands. Taiwan protested these unilateral actions, accusing China of disregarding flight safety and attempting to use civil aviation for political or military aims to change the straight status quo. The new flight route would reduce Taiwan's air defense reaction time, according to a military researcher. China's Taiwan Affairs Office described the changes as routine and aimed at airspace management and enhancing people-to-people -people exchanges. The M503 route is predominantly used by Chinese and foreign airlines traveling between Shanghai and Southeast Asia. Taiwan had previously complained about the M503 route in 2018, when China opened its northbound part without informing Taipei, violating a 2015 agreement to discuss such flight paths beforehand. Taiwan is conducting spring military drills in response to threats from China, which claims the island as its territory and aims to annex it, possibly through force. Journalists were taken to a base in Pingdong, featuring C-130 transport planes, E-2 early warning aircraft, and P-3 Orion submarine hunters. The P-3 aircraft showcased its capabilities, including dropping acoustic devices to detect submarines and carrying torpedoes, Maverick, and Harpoon missiles. China has increased military, diplomatic, and economic pressure on Taiwan since the recent election, where the Democratic Progressive Party returned to power with Vice President Lai ching -tie. Although encounters with Chinese forces are rare, Taiwan remains vigilant, scrambling fighter jets and alerting missile launch sites in response. The drills aim to boost public confidence in Taiwan's defense capabilities ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday, with a focus on air and naval displays demonstrating defiance against Chinese aggression. Fighter wings and naval forces will participate, reflecting Taiwan's strategy to deter PLA attempts to cross the Taiwan Strait. The Nationalist Party, which favors unification with China, suffered its third consecutive electoral defeat, maintaining political deadlock in Taiwan.